I, I knew you'd like that. <laughs> I figured it, the heat and humidity that we've had the last several days, just wanted to kind of set the tone a little bit this morning. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us. A warm welcome to those that are tuning in online as well. I hope the picture of the snow might uh, help you cool off just a little bit. <clears throat> For those of you who know me, and perhaps for the benefit of those who don't, if I were to describe myself, I would say that I, I don't think of myself as a complicated person. When it comes to learning, I always learn best, or I benefit from lessons that illustrate um, and teach a particular point. Consequently, object lessons really speak to me, or when it comes to scripture, I really enjoy the, the parables. And Jesus often taught in parables. The sower and the seed, the wise man who built his house on the rock, the prodigal son are just a few that come to my mind. And today we're going to look at a relationship. It's a true life illustration of a relationship between a man and his dog. In particular, the man is a sheep farmer and his dog is a border collie. Now, just for clarification, in my message today, there's going to be many references to shepherds and their sheep. Consequently, the scriptures use terms like master and servants to describe the relationship as well. And so the relationship between us, between God and ourselves, is illustrated as well. So let's begin. William W. Philip Keller is a favorite author of mine. He uses experiences from life to illustrate scriptural principles. He's written many books, some of which are the following. A shepherd looks at the 23rd Psalm, a gardener looks at the fruits of the Spirit, and a layman looks at the Lord's Prayer. Throughout his life, he worked as a rancher, a farmer, a wildlife photographer, a naturalist, and as a writer, he expressed his love for nature and God through many of his best-selling books. He was born in 1920, and Keller grew up on a cattle ranch in East African country of Kenya. His father had developed a breed of cattle that had been adapted to the tropics. His cattle were good for a source of meat and milk and income. And after high school, Keller attended to the University of Toronto in Canada, he then made his way to British Columbia in Western Canada to complete his university training in animal husbandry. Throughout college, he worked on various ranches and longed for the day when he would purchase his own spread and establish his own herd. He finally found a piece of neglected ranch property at the southern tip of Vancouver Island across the strait from the state of Washington. And because it had been so neglected, he got the property at a very fair price, but that left him with insufficient funds to purchase cattle, and so he had to start out with sheep. As the owner of Fairwinds, his newly purchased ranch, Keller realized he would need help to run the ranch and to handle the flock. That assistance would have to come from a faithful, loyal border collie, bred and disciplined for this unique type of work. So Keller had no choice but to find a coworker an under-shepherd in his sheepdog who would carry out and manage his flock. Working together in harmony, one good sheepdog and himself could accomplish as much as five men. The same principle applies to us and holds true for us in God's dealing with us. The Lord called himself the good shepherd. He pictured himself for us as the one who had come to care for the lost sheep. He carefully instructed his disciples to be co-laborers and to feed and tend his sheep. This illustration of caring for God's lost sheep really struck home the day that Keller drove up to the house of the lady who had advertised about a dog for sale. The lady was ranting and raving about this crazy collie. She had no idea how to handle such a beautiful creature. Bred for special service, and nor did she care that all the potential locked up in this animal had gone wrong. 
all the dog wants to do is to chase cars and boys on bicycles, and she won't listen, the lady said. It was a picture of so many of us. For in the dusty dog hobbled with chains, Keller saw a parallel with so many men and women who originally destined for noble service had fallen into the wrong hands. And now they struggle in despair of wasted, misspent years. The skilled breeders of the border collies in Britain had produced sheepdogs with intelligence and, and wisdom and energy. The beautiful specimen like Lass carried within her the capacity for outstanding work. But she had to be in the right hands. She had to come into the care of the good shepherd. And she had to have her old habits broken and her instincts channeled into the purpose for which she had been bred. You know, the same principle holds true for us. We have been created in the generous sovereignty of God to, tr to achieve great things for him. He endows us with the capacity to carry out his will and to do his work in the world as we work together under his care. It is his intention that we should touch lives, enrich spirits, and bring souls into his care and management. For this to happen, we must be freed from the rule of the wrong owner, and we must be released from the servanthood to sin, to self, and to our slave master, Satan. This means, of course, that the person that's unshackled from one owner has to be brought under the management of another. There is no such thing as absolute freedom. For even though human beings are free agents, they must come under the control of forces and influences greater than themselves. And Keller discovered seven important life lessons with his dog Lass, and I want to share them with you this morning. Lesson number one, in the wrong hands. Now, unfortunately, Lass had fallen into the wrong hands, and under the mishandling of the wrong owner, her talent had been wasted on chasing boys on bicycles and barking at cars. The sad, the sad, sad outcome was that day by day, she was actually hurting herself. We do the exact same thing. Jesus stated in John 8, 24, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Those who brag about being free seldom realize that they are bound by their destructive lifestyles. They are trapped in their own destructive decisions and desires. When Keller approached Lass, she met him with blazing eyes, low growls, and bared teeth. She did not want to be touched. She trembled at the tone of an unfamiliar voice. This was not surprising. She had been misused, abused, twisted, and torn in spirit. How or why would she even trust anyone? And this is precisely the same with us when the fir at first the great shepherd comes to us with outstretched hands. We resist his approach. We resent his voice calling us. We recoil in fear from his overtones of goodwill. Doubts and misgivings surge through our minds. We cringe from his coming. Our wills are set in stern resistance. We are convinced that we will suffer under the yoke that he wants us to bear. But it is only the hand of God that can really set us free. It is his strong hands that can train us to move in new directions. It is his gentle yet strong hands that can handle us with skill and love and strength. It is in his hands that change to, can, can occur in our character, alter our conduct, and send us out to do great and noble service. The first owner that Lass had did not understand dogs. She did not care about the capabilities of this beautiful creature. She only wanted to get rid of Lass as quickly as possible. Few of us think seriously about the sinister character of Satan. Too many, to, to, to too many people, he is almost less than real nothing more than a superstition or a product of man's imagination. The terrible truth is that he is very real, very active, and exceedingly deceptive. While appearing to give us liberty by allowing us to do whatever we wish, he watches us enslave and destroy ourselves. 1 Peter 5.8, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Ultimately, in the case of Lass, unless a new owner had intervened, she would have been destroyed. Happily, that did not happen. A stranger showed up in her backyard that day. His coming would change her entire life. 
this one who came to Saul beyond the dirt and the dust that matted her coat. He saw the magnificent head, the strong muscular build, the beauty, the beautiful body so well proportioned. He knew the powerful potential and the good that was locked within this creature. So Keller unshackled her and unchained her, put a soft collar around her neck, and took her to his house. She had passed from one set of hands into another, and at first it was terrifying, but, that one, but one day she would know it was all for good. Many of us have been in the wrong hands. We have been so mishandled that all of the original superb purposes for which we were created have been distorted. We are virtual slaves to sin, to ourselves and to Satan. Yet the stranger from Galilee comes into our lives. He looks upon us with love and sees beyond our sins. He extends his hand to take us into his loving care. We're not always eager to go. Life under the old master has made us suspicious. In our human ignorance, we are convinced that to come into Christ's care could even be worse bondage than before. As Keller put Lass into his car and he started down the road to his ranch, she was sure something terrible was going to happen. She crouched on the floor behind the seat, trembling and tense with apprehension. It would take weeks and months for Lass to fully discover that her new master only had her best interest at heart. It takes some of us a lifetime to learn that Christ, our good shepherd, knows exactly what he's doing with us. He understands us perfectly. He manages us with incredible wisdom and loving skill, both for our benefit and for his. Lesson number two, set free to follow. Long before Keller had brought Lass home, he had prepared a new kennel. There was a new leash as well, clean bowls for food and water. Everything was in readiness for the dog chosen to be his companion and his co-worker. All of these hopes and dreams and aspirations moved through his mind as he drove home with Lass in the car. Here in the country setting, all was tranquil. The only sounds were the wind in the trees, the waves splashing on the shore, and an occasional cry from the seagulls or the crows. There would be no boys racing up and down the street on bicycles, no cars roaring down the road. Lass was coming into a new setting of quiet serenity. She was entering into the life of a brand new master. What would she do? Her initial reaction was to slink away, crouched low in the grass, a combination of both fear and uncertainty. Speaking to her in soft and petting her gently, Keller led her to the kennel, situated in the shade of a huge oak tree. Lass just simply stared at it, refusing to enter. Instead, she stubbornly crouched at the entrance, staring up at him with defiant eyes. A bowl full of food and fresh water were placed before, but Lass refused to touch either and ignored them. This went on day after day. There was no sign of positive response. She lost weight and muscle tone. In a bold and desperate act, Keller undid her leash and set her free. In a flash, she was gone and she vanished into the woods. In the days that follow, Keller drove up and down the country road in hopes of finding her. He checked in with neighboring ranches, searched the fields and the, and the ocean's edge, but no sign of lass. In the anguish of his search, Keller began to understand a little of the sorrow that God endures in all of his efforts to draw us near to him. Again and again, we refuse his benefits offered to us. Belligerently, we rebuff his love and his concern. Keller couldn't help but have an enormous empathy for her. He was consumed with the desire to make her into a loving, loyal companion. He yearned to see her rise to the potential that lay dormant inside of her. All these dreams just seemed to dash into the dust. Until one evening, he looked up onto the edge of the rough outcrop of rock behind their house. And there she was. Keller decided to take some food and water up to the spot where he had seen her and to leave it there. Every morning, it was gone. And yet every evening, she would be back. Every time he tried to approach her, call her name or whistle, she would vanish, whisked away like smoke in the wind. Keller began to wonder if this distant dog would ever truly become his. She did not mind eating the food set out for her or drinking the water that had been poured out for her, for she relished the freedom that she had been given. But she was not his, and he was not hers. Our Lord comes to us in our plight, 
He offers to take us into his family. He spares no pain to provide all that is necessary for our welfare and contentment. He speaks to us reassuringly. He calls us by name. He sets us totally free. Yet the personal response of most people is to resist him. They resent his approach. They refuse to respond to his overture of compassion, and they flee to escape from his hands. God in Christ has come to set people free. He has placed before them the benefits and delights of belonging to his family. He has made available to them his love and his care and his provisions in generous measure. In spite of this, their liberty and freedom is used for selfish ends. They insist on things, doing things their own way, at their own time, and under their own power. They are not under the master's control. All the good which they are capable of comes to nothing. One night, a few sheep were grazing up near the rocks where last would appear. Keller saw her sit up and cock her head and watch them with great intensity. Perhaps her latent instincts to be a shepherd's uh, dog were coming to life. Each evening, he would direct a few sheep up towards her, hoping that somehow they would establish contact between him and her. But nothing seemed to gain a positive response. He wondered if all his overtures of love had been in vain. The prospect that maybe she would have to be destroyed loomed even larger. This was one of the most important lessons Keller learned from Lass. It was she who would eventually must make the decision or not whether she would come to him, entrust her care to him, and allow him to take control of her life. As her new master, he had done everything he could within his own power and love for her. Now she, in response to his compassion, would have to choose to come to him of her own free will. The last thing in the world that Keller wanted was to have this dog destroyed. The very thought grieved him. He did not want to lose this lovely creature. God's word is very clear in this whole matter. He does not come to condemn us. He does not desire to destroy us. For God does not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We ourselves choose what our end shall be. We are free to follow our own ways, or, or we are free to follow him who came to deliver us. With all these thoughts running through his mind, Keller would go out at twilight and try to draw the angry creature to himself. Sadly, little by little, his hopes grew dimmer. Time was running out. Week after week was passing by, and the time was approaching when she might have to be destroyed. Then one summer evening, the sun was setting. Sheep were feeding peaceably by the pastures by the water's edge. Then softly, almost unnoticeable, Keller sensed a faint touch of a warm nose touching his hand that he held behind his back. A thrill of delight swept over him. Lass had come. The distance between them had been crossed. Joy swept over him. Hope sprang anew. Luke 15, 7 says Jesus saying, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Keller could understand the desires and dreams of God for his people. When a single soul responds to God's love, there is reason for celebration. Keller's prodigal had come home, and she, all she had to do was follow her master. It was to be a remarkable relationship of mutual trust undivided loyalty, and worthwhile work that she had never experienced before. As he embraced his dog and ran his hands over her fur, he spoke to her in reassuring tones. She knew at last that this is where she belonged. She had found the courage to put herself into the master's hands. And in this choice that she found, she found unlimited liberty, the liberty of being, lo of, of being a loving friend and a servant. In the fading twilight that night, she followed him home to the cottage. Quietly, she entered her kennel and laid down to rest in peace and contentment. The lesson is so clear. The choice is ours whether we will or will not come to Christ our good shepherd. For the person who does, it is to discover his boundless love, his enormous goodwill, his generous care and acceptance into his family. In all of these lies liberty, contentment, and total fulfillment. Lesson number three, learning to trust. For the first few weeks of their new relationship, Lass was like a highly strung musical instrument. The lightest touch of Keller's hand on her made her tremble with tension. She had been out of tune for life with life for so long 
that it took considerable time and patience to bring her back into harmony with himself. In her subconscious mind lingered the dark shadows of abuse that she had suffered under the wrong hands. Time after time, he would take her into her arms just to hold her close. At first, she would only endure this for a few moments, and then with a sudden leap, she would bound out of his embrace, wondering if he really meant it. But when Keller would brush her thick coat, it seemed to put her at ease. She learned to trust him when he carefully removed the burrs from her body or pulled the thorns from between her toes. When the sting ceased, she would lick his hand in gratitude. In all of these intimate contacts, he began to realize that he was as much her servant as she was his. God's gentle spirit showed him the reality of the enormous condescension of Christ, who in love and self-humiliation tends to our needs as well. God does indeed become the perfect picture of servanthood. He comes to comfort, to heal, and to help. He comes to be our companion. And so it is with our lives. In gratitude for God's touch in our lives, there is born in us a desire to be a servant on his behalf. 1 John 4.19 says we love him because he first loved us. And so this basic interchange of loving concern for each other was the foundation on which trust and confidence was built between Keller and Lass. Too many of us have the wrong idea of work with God. We look upon it as a bondage, and that's not that at all. For when we truly come to know his touch upon our lives and, and sense the sweetness of his spirit at work in our souls, we are li liberated into a joyous experience. For last, part of this wondrous new relationship was the sound of Keller's voice. She learned to listen for it. She learned its inflection and tone. She discovered that he meant what he said, and unlike her former owner who ranted and raved and screamed and threatened in angry tirades, John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. When Keller called her, she quickly discovered that she was expected to come. She would be petted and praised. She would be shown that her compliance and cooperation were mutually delightful. To hear his voice was to alert herself to respond to it, and what he said he meant. What he told her, she could trust. What he commanded, she was expected to carry out. When, she, when he spoke, she would cock her ears to catch every syllable. She would tilt her head to one side and listen. She would fasten her eyes on his face, alert, eager, ready to take immediate action. Just as is important is how we respond to God's voice. For God does speak. He speaks through his written word, through prophets of old, and through Christ, and through his people. He speaks through his own spirit within us and through the wonder of his created universe. Let's ask ourselves, do I alert myself to hear God's voice? Do I set myself to be sensitive to his sounds? Do I truly concentrate on his commands? Am I ready to respond with promptness to his wishes? Lesson four, the delight of obedience. Lessons taught the last were intense and uncomplicated. The words of the command were short and to the point. Come, sit, fetch, stop, stay, down, right, left, and so on. They were spoken clearly, explicitly, without waste of syllables. By degrees, she learned the meaning of each one. Steadily, she began to respond. It became obvious to Keller that just as his will and wishes for this devoted dog were expressed in clear and concise terms. So, likewise, God's will for him had been stated in simple, straightforward language in God's word. God has not left us without clear instructions. His word is sharp, precise, and to the point. And it is to our humble responsibility to learn to respond to it. There can be at times confusion in which people claim not to understand clearly what his intentions are. There really is no excuse for this. Any person who desires to know and do God's will can find it clearly stated in his word. The basic difficulty is not lack of comprehension on our part. The question is simply the reluctance to yield our own, to our own wills. Most of us will not submit to the control of Christ. Part of the struggle that we have obe with obedience has been associated with the traditional idea of serving God in fear. The use of this word throughout the Old Testament has most unfortunately, left the wrong impression in our minds. However, to fear in regard to God means to reverence, to hold in such loving esteem as to be afraid of grieving the one so admired. Now, I'm going to say that again. 
To fear in regard to God means to reverence, to hold in such loving esteem as to be afraid of grieving the one so admired. Have you ever loved someone so much it would grieve you to disappoint them? Ultimately, our love for God is demonstrated in our obedience to his will and in our loving cooperation with his commands. When we comply with God's wishes, our walk with him, our work with him, our way with him become a deep, deep delight. Not only is he immensely pleased, but so are we. Keller says that it never ceased him to amaze and amaze him to see how thrilled Laz, Lass was in her wholehearted obedience. Her eyes would sparkle with pure pleasure. Her tail would wag with joy. Her body was vibrant and ecstatic with satisfaction. And this holds true for us too. We all have a lot to unlearn, but are we anxious to obey? At heart, do we ultimately want God's approval? In addition to learning verbal commands, the more demanding lessons for Lass involved working to hand signals. It was essential that she master this means of communication for two reasons. First, Keller would often be at a great distance from Lass, almost out of voice range. And secondly, it was much less disturbing to the sheep if they communicated in comparative silence. For this sort of command to work well, Lass had to keep Keller in view and give him her, him, her constant undivided attention. The parallel relationship in our walk with the Lord is most important. For as we mature in our spiritual lives, we come to understand clearly the providential hand of God guiding us. Early in our relationship with Christ, we discover his will for our lives through the spoken word. In time, his word grows so familiar that we're able to sense and detect his will. We look for God's hand in all the details and events of our days. We become sensitive to his presence we find our minds and spirits and emotions concentrated and focused on Christ, and we're eager for, to, for, for his next command. This does not happen overnight. It took Lass a long month to learn the hand commands, and likewise takes years for us to sense the unmistakable hand of God directing us. But there is no greater joy than this harmonious relationship with God. This is what it means to be a friend of God. There is no strain or tension but rather a sweet fellowship. The end result of this harmonious relationship wasn't just between Keller and Lass, but became an enormous benefit to the ranch and the sheep as well. For the sheep discovered that Lass meant them no harm, that they could not outwit her, and they found contentment in doing what she wanted them to do. And the same holds true for us in our contacts with others. If men and women are going to understand something of the will of God, it has to be through our obedience and devotion to him. This is truly how God intends his work to be done in this world. His work can be done with delight, and it can be done so that others will benefit. Lesson five, the test of faithfulness. Well, during the years that they worked together, several problem areas began to appear in Lass's behavior. In a strange way, one of the greatest strengths became also one of her greatest weaknesses. It was the matter of Lass always wanting Keller in view at all times. So it can be understood that the one command she found the most difficult to obey was stay. At times, she would be asked to guard an open gate, or she might be expected to hold a small band of ewes in a corner while Keller checked out their lambs, or it might be any number of little tasks that required her to be steadfast, alert, and on guard while, she was, while he was about of doing other duties. When Keller would disappear from view, Lass would feel like she was missing out on the action or that she had been forgotten and she would become uneasy, begin to move about, and then take off in search of him. When Keller came back to find her gone, it was always a disappointment. The sheep had scattered, the work had been done undone, and now the task would have to be started all over again. This is an important lesson for us as well. The, the, the necessity to be quietly steadfast and faithful wherever God has placed us. Such times of inaction make, make us feel that God has forgotten us. At such times, we do not have the greater view, or the big picture, if you will, of what the good shepherd is doing. We do not see his hand at work. We are tempted to break faith and make the next move all on our own. It is in the daily duties of our little lives where God asks us to be loyal, steady friends, a people who will perform their part without fanfare, those who can be trusted implicitly, implicitly to do their duty. Keller recalled with fondness how thrilled he was when he would find that Lass, Lass had not struck out from her post and she had played her part well. She would revel in his praise. 
It is exactly the same for us. Christ can be given the great joy of finding us faithful in the place that he puts us. His measurement of our success does not lie in spectacular activities, but in us staying true to him. Distractions that lure us away from what we know we should be doing also play a part in our faithfulness. It is essential for us to examine our lives and determine what diverts us from the duties to which God has called us. Circumstances which are not part of God's purposes for us intrude themselves into our, our experiences. At first, they may seem harmless, even somewhat entertaining. The difficulty is that they distract us from the most important responsibilities to the Lord. They lure us away and tempt us to take off in hot pursuit. In the process, our energies are wasted, our strength is expelled, and the end benefit to God amounts to nothing. For last, the distraction came in the form of crows. The noisy black rascals had established their nest in trees by the shore. They regarded Lass and Keller as intruders in their territory and seemed to find pleasure in tormenting Lass with their squawking and low flying. The crows became a temptation and a distraction to her duties. The distraction would become so strong that Lass would tear away after them, leaping and barking and racing all over the fields. It became an obstacle to the efficient operation of the ranch, too. The crow's silly games wore her out and exhausted her energies for her useful service. The crows were an illustration of how an outside influence can disrupt the work at hand. They flew in from outside the property. They were not part of the ranch's operation, and they distracted the focus on what she needed to be done. God looks for us to be faithful wherever he places us in, all, in his all-wise plans and purposes. Lesson number six, love and discipline. So over time, the mutual affection established between Keller and Lass was very precious to both of them. At times, it seemed the relationship was much more than just dog and man, more than shepherd and sheepdog, even more than efficient co-workers. They had become special friends. This is precisely the relationship Christ desires with us. More than anything, he wants us to be his companion his co-worker, his friend, in helping to tend his flock. This is the essence of the final discourse Jesus shared with his 11 disciples before his death. It's recorded in great detail in the book of John, chapters 14 through 17. In particular, chapter 15, verses 12 through 14 read, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater is no love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. This is one thing to write. It is one thing to write about laying down your life for your friend. It's equally, it's, it is equally easy to say it, but the toughest lesson for any of us is to live it out. We are a selfish, self-serving people, and yet God in Christ came among us in lowly service. He came to minister to us, to give himself for us, and so we in turn are, should be willing and ready to love him and others. Continually, Keller was giving himself to Lass. He gave her his strength, his attention, his affection, his loyalty, his friendship, his very life. Lass, in turn, reciprocated this outpouring by giving back her vitality, her enthusiasm, her cooperation, her love and loyalty. It would be wonderful if every relationship like this would end on a good note, but it cannot. There were some disappointing times. There were times when Lass did break faith, days when she did not remain steadfast. To correct her and to mend the breach between them, there had to be discipline. This was not easy or pleasant, but it was absolutely essential. Keller loved Lass far too much to let her revert back to her old, wretched lifestyle. He was too fond of her to allow her to waste energy for nothing. She was made for great things, intended for lofty service. So both of them would have to suffer to set her straight. Discipline is never pleasant. The correction that comes with love causes pain for both the administrator and the recipient. But true love demands discipline. To correct Lass with stern words or a severe reprimand made her draw back with reproach. Her eyes would fill with foreboding. She would lay back her ears and crouch low with her tail between her legs. For a few moments, there would be a distinct coolness between them. Keller never allowed these moments to last long. Correction came swiftly, surely, and yet it was over in short order. Then he would call her quietly to him and speak to her in soft, reassuring tones. He would hold her close and rub her head and fur, and she would reassure, he would reassure her 
that they were still friends and that all was well. Hebrews 12, 6 and 11 says, For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them who have been trained by it. Like last, we shrink from discipline of God. We find it painful. We would rather it not happen at all. But discipline needs to happen, and it is for our best. It is for God's benefit and for the eventual blessing of others whose lives we touch. And when it's all over, the bonds of affection between Christ and ourselves are even stronger than before. For instinctively, deep within our souls, we know we deserve discipline. We know God would not be true to himself or to us if he simply overlooked our misconduct. He disciplines because he cares, because he loves, because he heals. And with this reassurance comes renewed joy. There is total restoration. There is pure delight in once again being at one. Lesson seven, available for anything. Perhaps the most unforgettable lesson Keller learned from last can be summed up in these three words, available for anything. Lass had told them, taught him what it really means to be utterly abandoned to her master's purposes. She showed him in her loving devotion what it costs to always be available for anything that needed to be done in the interest of the ranch and the flock. This is best understood in two entirely different types of responsibilities that Lass was expected to carry out. The first had to do with the gathering up or counting of sheep. The surest way to make sure that, and certain that all things were well is for the shepherd to take count every day. This way he knows if there's any sheep that, are, that are, are, are in harm. Cougars and stray dogs could wreak havoc among the flocks at night, and only an accurate count would determine the losses. On other occasions, the sheep would wander into wild and rough out-of-the-way areas. The sheep loved to work their way into these spots, searching for stray patches of sweet grass. It was no easy thing to find the flock in such difficult country. At his command, Keller would call, fetch them, lass, go out and bring them in. And without hesitating, in an instant, she would be gone, pushing through the undergrowth, running over the rough rocks. There was a high cost in all of this for the dog. She would become very weary. Her face would become scratched and torn by thickets. Her coat would be matted with burrs and twigs. Sometimes the pads of her feet would be cut with the sharp stones. Yet she went gladly with happy abandon. Not once did she hesitate to hurl herself into the tightest tangle and to gather up the flock. She knew that Keller knew what he was doing, and all she desired was to be part of the whole project. The second responsibility was to guard the flock from the intruders. To warn of predators, bells were put on the sheep. If the sheep were startled in the dark, they would leap to their feet and flee for their lives. The wild twink tinkling of the bells would awaken both Keller and Lass from their sleep. As Keller left the house, instantly Lass would be by his side. No need to even call her. With experience, she too had learned to listen for the alarm of the sheep bells ringing. Leaping joyously beside him, she would run up to him in the darkness of the night and lick his hand as if to say, Cheer up, boss. I'm here. We're in this adventure together. Some nights, Keller would actually spend the entire night keeping watch in the fields. Lass would lay crouched on the guard right beside him, her head often resting on his lap, but her eyes never closed, her ears always alert for the faintest sounds. If anything aroused her, a deep growl would rumble in her chest, and he would be ready. Reflecting on all this, Keller began to see why it is that Christ calls us, as his co-workers, to go into tough places. Being his friend is no carry a cozy guarantee that life will always be easy or even agreeable. There are simply bound to be some tough assignments, some suffering, if we are to fully comply to his commands. Keller never sent Lass into hard places to hurt her, but he would send her into challenging situations to save the sheep. All of us as God's people seem to shrink back from suffering. We are often reluctant to undertake even the smallest assignment for the Lord. We are reluctant to share our time and our strength and talents to, teach, to help and teach others in trouble. We draw back from the distasteful situation where we might have to suffer a bit in order that others might be saved. Many of us fa fail to realize what a noble honor it is to be called a friend of God. We don't always see the big picture as God does, and we forget that he really does know what he's doing. He is utterly in command and control of every situation. So let us trust him fully. Let us follow him fearlessly. 
let us fling ourselves with glad abandon into his work. It is well for us to remind ourselves of the unfaltering faithfulness of God. We are too prone to believe that he was really not with us, that he does not know much about the dangers that confront us, that he's out of touch with things. Last helped Keller to understand that it is often in the darkest hour during pressure. that gives us peace. It is his nearness that gives us hope, and it is his protection that gives us life. And in the midst of all this, God enjoys our company. He loves to have us alongside. He too finds consolation in the eager, alert watchfulness of his friends. In the midst of danger, there's delight. We need not to be alarmed or anxious. Woven throughout this simple story, this real life parable is the profound spiritual truth that just like last, we can be transformed into magnificent beings that he created us to be if we will simply listen and obey the master's voice. I thank you for listening. I pray these words have been encouragement to you, maybe even a challenge to you as you consider your relationship with our Lord Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the wonderful examples from Scripture. We thank you that how even in, in life, your great design is evident in the creatures you've created, in the people that we are, in, the, in nature about us, how it all works in harmony when it's working to your honor and glory. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, to stay focused on you, to give ourselves to you in a way that allows you to train us and transform us, to make us into what we are supposed to be in your eyes. So, Lord, we thank you for the work of your word and your spirit and for your love and provisions and blessings in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be more like your son in all that we do. So we pray this now, Lord, in his precious name and commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen.